I hope you've had an opportunity to view that video lecture entitled America at War. It traces the early stages of the Civil War, really from the ordinances of secession to 1862. Um, I want to put a pin in the military history of the Civil War, at least for right now, and talk about what the war itself is going to do uh, to the home front. Um, in so many different situations involving American history, it, it's actually how the war changes life at home that is actually going to be at least as important as the war itself. And certainly the Civil War qualifies as such an example. But um, early on in the conflict, there are leaders, officials within the Union Army, the Northern Army, that are just going to describe the Civil War as a total war. Now what they mean by this is the totality of northern society was fighting, was battling the totality of southern society. Everything that the north had access to, uh, everything that gave it an advantage, whether we're talking about transportation or landscape, um, all the things that it produced and offered up as services that could be deployed against the South and the war and vice versa. Well, the simple fact of the matter is this economic boom that uh, we saw in the Industrial Revolution that was generally a northerner, a uh, northeastern phenomenon, right? And certainly this element of industry is going to give the North a really big advantage when it comes to fighting this war. Keep in mind, in places like Boston, what they make are ships. Obviously, that has a military connection to it. In places like Pennsylvania, all throughout New York State, what they're producing, metal products. What they grow in places like Ohio and western Pennsylvania are food crops like wheat and corn. You can use those crops to feed your armies. You can't feed your army with cotton. So huge, huge advantage when it comes to the north as far as this total war is concerned. And one of the ones that's often overlooked is the population. By the start of the war, even before the start of the war, the North outnumbered the South six to one. Not what you're thinking. I don't mean soldiers. I mean workers. I mean people to spit this uh, military produce out morning, noon, and night, which is going to prove to be a very, very essential uh, act uh, aspect of the war considering if you can't feed and equip your army it doesn't matter how many times Robert E. Lee defeats the North um, eventually he's gonna run out of resources so this is a huge advantage for the North and it's one of the bigger surprises as to how and why the North is managing to lose this war at least as far as 1862 is concerned now the other thing that comes out of the Civil War and I'm gonna put this rather loosely, but it's what you and I would probably call big business. Great big huge companies, later corporations, are really gonna be born during the Civil War, gonna cut their teeth anyway. And one very good example of that would be the Colt Manufacturing Company that was founded in 1855 in Connecticut by a guy named Samuel Colt. And what Colt is going to do around about that period is he's going to invent the revolver. This was a really, really big deal because not only was it a weapon that you could hold in your hand, it was not a rifle, it was not big and bulky, it was very convenient in that way, but it was an automatic uh, gun. It was an automatic firearm. Um, if, if you know anything about the rifles that were used in the Civil War, you, 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 if you were one of the best of the best, you could fire maybe two rounds per minute. Because every time you fired, you'd have to unload it, uh, clean it, put more powder back in it, reload it, right? put your ramrod back in place, and fire it again. And it was very time-consuming. Right? So the Colt revolver is a really big invention as we near the Civil War, and, and simply put, both sides want it. As a matter of fact, between 1861 and 1863, Colt is going to sell more than 107,000 models of his Colt Army model alone. And in the aftermath of the war, not only is Colt going to be a very, very wealthy man, he is going to be a huge pillar in industry. And you're going to see this in industry after industry after industry, um, some of which we'll talk about a little bit later in this lecture. 
But 1863 is really going to be the, 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 the key year for the North, uh, both in terms of success on the battlefield, but also getting its ducks in a row when it comes to its industries. As I mentioned before, all the industrial advantages that you can want, they're right there squarely in the North. What you've got is not just the manufacturing capabilities, you also have natural resources like the coal industry in Pennsylvania. In New England, um, and certainly we've talked about this in this class, uh, you've got woolen production, you've got a textile industry. Now, it's important that uh, you know that we're not talking about cotton-based uniforms, so it's not exactly going to breathe all that well for those Union soldiers. And one of the big reasons why is, where's cotton produced? The Deep South. The Deep South is fighting the North, and so we're going to have to switch over to woolen, which is not going to be all that advantageous, but once again, having a textile industry is going to prove to be very, very useful for winning this war. You are also going to see a new, um, a new worker enter into the paid labor force. That's going to be women and children. And the reason why is that the men are off fighting the war. And so on the one hand, this creates an opportunity for women workers, for children workers. Um, but on the other hand, it's going to be a situation where they're paid less. You could justify paying a woman less. Certainly you could justify paying a child less. And unfortunately, this does have a negative side effect when it comes to the aftermath of the war, the use of child labor would continue. As a matter of fact, that's probably going to be a really important point that you uh, that you spend some time on for those of you that go on to take the more modern American history class. Um, it's certainly going to be a problem for female workers that, that really won't be even be addressed, let alone resolved, until the mid-20th century. Okay. Um, but this economic stimulus is going to reach into many different industries, and maybe, perhaps the most important is going to be that of the railroad industry. Now, way back in this semester, when we were talking about the transportation revolution, I noted at the time that railroads would eventually replace steamboats as the preferred method of transportation for industry. And the reason why is very simple. They can go where boats cannot go, right? The only problem is it's relatively expensive to build a railroad, and you're not going to recoup those, those investments not, not, not very quickly after, after you go ahead and invest. And so it's a problem in that you're not going to have any takers that go ahead and jump on this opportunity to build a railroad. Certainly they're not going to do this out of the kindness of their hearts. I think you can see where I'm going with this. In 1862, what the federal government is going to do is it's going to incentivize railroad construction by issuing something called the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862. What this is going to do is it's going to authorize great big huge chunks of land to be given to railroad construction companies. And not only that, but they're also guaranteeing loans. In other words, if you, if you are in the railroad construction business, uh, we can guarantee that you will not only get that loan, that influx of capital, but we can guarantee the bank that if you, the railroad company, default on that loan, we, the government, will pay you back. Now, it's not a coincidence that the government is really pushing the railroads during the Civil War because it's what we call logistics. Keep in mind, this is a total war. And when I say total, I also mean the, the, the mechanism by which you bring that product to the soldier. The supply lines. Those armies that can not only reinforce themselves with fresh troops, but also bring desperately needed supplies food, ammunition, blankets, um, that is going to prove to be a very big advantage. So it's not that the government is just doing this uh, simply for the sake of doing it. Uh, the railroad construction is really going to be an, an, an aspect to win the war. And in the end, it's going to lead to what we call the Transcontinental Railroad.
1869, we will complete that railroad that begins in Chicago and ends in San Francisco, and it's going to be largely due to some of these land grants and government-backed loans that are issued early on in the Civil War. But speaking of a governmental economic stimulus, you're also going to see what, what I would probably describe as a modern American economy emerge during this period. Okay, um, I mean things like the creation of a national currency and a national banking system. Those issues come into effect during this time period. Um, we begin to place tariffs on imported goods. As a matter of fact, the Republican Party at this particular moment is not exactly the party of free trade. Um, it is a interest, or it has a interest in, in, in business. And what people in places like the Northeast, which absolutely was Republican territory during that period, what they wanted was protection from foreign competitors to their business interests. And generally speaking, that's what you get in this civil war. But more than anything else, what you begin to see is the explosion of the federal budget. Obviously, you're going to have to pay for these things that you're going to need to fight the war. Um, I told you that Colt alone is registering more than 107,000 orders for revolvers uh, in three years in and of themselves. Um, multiply that by an entire economy. And so by 1865, you've got a government that's spending $1.3 billion um, on this war. And it's going to create the situation that we, to some extent, live with today. Uh, the federal government is a very good customer um, in the sense that not only does it buy great big huge chunks, um, but it is, it, it is, it is something that uh, is, is pretty reliable when it comes to paying its debts, right? And so you're going to see this, uh, what, what later on in the 20th century is going to be known as the business government partnership. Um, this is really going to at least be born out of in the time period of the Civil War, and it's going to modernize our economy. Um, you're also going to see more and more immigration from abroad, okay? We've talked about this issue before. I know you know that uh, one of the things that the Second Industrial Revolution uh, led to was massive waves of immigration from Europe and especially Ireland. The Civil War is going to continue that trend. You'll see people coming from the British Isles. You'll see them coming from Germany. And you'll especially see them coming from Ireland. By 1865, you're going to see uh, more than 500,000 new immigrants arriving on American shores. And it's primarily because we've got a labor shortage. Uh, once again, most of the guys have enlisted in the, uh, in the service. They're fighting the war. And most of these immigrants are headed toward the north, right? The reason that they're headed toward the north is because that's where industry is based. Once again, you're going to see this trend continue uh, into the 1870s, 1880s. Uh, the names and the places and the faces will change a little bit, uh, eastern and southern Europe, but still they're headed to places like Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, New York, right? That trend is absolutely going to continue in, uh, in, in the later part of the 19th century. I want to talk a little bit about how this is going to change uh, the game for women workers. I know that you know that Lowell, Massachusetts and the industries that would come to call Lowell home actually recruited New England farm girls. And for these girls who were paid very low wages, this was a real opportunity because for the first time in their lives, they were not only making their own money, but they, they, they were living outside of any kind of male supervision, okay? The Civil War is going to usher in that realm of opportunity for female workers as well, okay? Um, for example, sewing women, okay? Sewing and producing uniforms is going to be a really huge industry during the war. It's going to be a very important need. And what these sewing women would be given would be not only contracts to produce out of their homes, but uh, the raw materials purchased by the government and sewn together by these sewing women that are producing a very important element in the war. 
Simply put, this is going to open up more and more economic opportunities for people that have generally been on the outside looking in. It's also going to open up some female-dominated industries, one of which is going to be nursing. But I think you could make the case that the medical industry generally opens up for women really across the board. Okay? Women worked in northern hospitals. They worked in union camps and in different capacities than simply uh, nurses, uh, auxiliaries. People like Clara Barton, Mary Ann Mother Bickendike. Um, they were hospital administrators. If you've ever had the misfortune of an extended stay at a hospital, you'll understand that it's a great big, huge, complex thing. It's not something that just kind of runs itself. And people like Marianne uh, Bickerdyke, in particular, are really going to immerse themselves in that professional world. So it's not simply that women are entering into the paid labor force. You might even say that the Civil War is opening up the professions to American women. But maybe the best example that I can point to when it comes to this phenomenon is the lady that you're looking at on the screen over there, a woman by the name of Dr. Mary Walker. Now, this is going to open up the medical industry in terms of physicians for women as well. And Walker is a very good example of that. But more importantly, for her services in the Civil War, she is going to be the first woman in American history to be awarded the Medal of Honor. And so over the course of time, what this is going to do is it's going to create popular support for female entrance into uh, the medical profession. It's also going to transform the landscape of the South. Um, up until this point, I've really focused on the Northern economy, and I want to change gears just a little bit and talk about what's going on in the South. Initially, what you're going to see would be Southern efforts to kind of industrialize in places like Richmond, Mobile, Alabama, Atlanta. They're going to become important centers of production. Uh, before the war, you really only had places like Macon, Georgia, and Harpers Ferry, Virginia. Those are really some of the only places that you're seeing any kind of arsenals, places where guns are manufactured. Um, that's absolutely going to change, at least in the early stages of the war. In a way, the South is beginning to look like the North, and um, you, you really wonder what would have happened had a guy by the name of uh, William Tecumseh Sherman uh, not made his march to the sea in 1864. I'll tell you a little bit more about that here in a minute. For right now, I want to talk a little bit about the state of Texas, because one of the things that you're going to see rise in that particular state would be the firearm industry, the, the, the weapons industry. The guy that is the governor of Texas at this particular moment is a guy by the name of Edward Clark. And what Clark is really going to do is he's going to encourage the industrialization of the state of Texas, especially when it comes to weapon manufacturing. And generally speaking, he's going to see a lot of traction. You'll see gun manufacturers setting up shop people like N.B. Tanner that are going to locate their facilities in places like Bastrop, Texas. Um, you are going to see power mills being established in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, in particular, Waxahachie, Texas is going to be an important uh, center for power mills. Um, in in the little 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 bit outside of the shadow of Texas, but Little Rock, Arkansas, is also going to be a very uh, important center for gun making uh, machinery. In other words, the, the the places that will produce the machines that will ultimately produce the guns. Um, now, when Little Rock fell in September 1863, what you begin to see is all those uh, machines, all of that uh, industrial capital transferred from Little Rock into Tyler, Texas, which would replace 
Little Rock as the uh, epicenter of the gun making machinery. And so if you're able to kind of put all of these together, yeah, I'm hopeful that you can see that Texas is a really important state to the Confederacy. It's where the weapons are being made, or at least a big chunk of them. This is going to be a really big deal in 1863 when the North is going to win the Battle of Vicksburg. Now, Vicksburg's right on the edge of the Mississippi River, and the reason that that's important is that Battle of Vicksburg is going to give the Union Army, the Northern Army, a complete monopoly of the Mississippi River. And when it has that, what the North is going to be able to do is cut off not only Louisiana and Arkansas, but also cut off Texas, a very, very important state for reasons that we've just got done outlining cut it off from participating in the rest of the war. Again, if this is a total war and it's about resources and reinforcing those resources, this is a really bad development for the Confederacy in 1863. Okay. Part of the reason that industrial efforts were abandoned in the South um, has a lot to do not only with northern victories in places like Tennessee uh, and um, Arkansas that uh, we've talked about here for a moment, uh, but also that uh, famous march to the sea. In 1864, the guy leading Union armies in uh, Georgia, a guy by the name of William Tecumseh Sherman, is going to cut himself off from his supply lines after Atlanta fell, and he's going to make a war against the Southern Confederacy in the sense that it's going to take this to the civilians. He's going to burn down buildings. He's going to raid farms and homes. And in the process, he's going to set flame to great big huge chunks of territory, including Atlanta. Now keep in mind, Atlanta was not only urbanizing, but also uh, industrializing. And ultimately, this is really going to put a stop to that industrial growth. And in the aftermath of this devastating defeat, what the South is ultimately going to go back to was what it was knew, no, what it knew best, which was agriculture. In a sense, um, the devastating end of the Civil War is really going to thwart Southern efforts to diversify its economy with industry. Okay. In the time that we have remaining, I want to talk to you about the institution of dissent, disagreeing. Um, I think that most people would have described the Civil War as a necessary war, but that doesn't mean that everybody was on the same page. Okay. We've been talking about guns and food and all of this stuff, but one thing that we haven't really talked about is manpower. How are you going to get the manpower necessary to fight the war? It's easy to recruit before the bullets start flying. It's after people get a good long look of exactly what war involves. That's when it becomes difficult. And so we're running out of warm bodies, at least Lincoln is in the North. In 1863, Lincoln issues something called the Enrollment Act. That's what we would call the draft, conscription, pressed into military service. Okay? Every able-bodied man above and beyond the age of 18 had to register for the draft. And they would call your name or pick it out of a great big huge pot. And if your number came up, that meant, like it or not, you're going off to war. But there were ways of getting out of it. For example, $300 could buy you a replacement. Now, $300 doesn't sound like an enormous amount of money to us, but it was a lot of money back in the 1860s. And so the only people that could really afford to do that would be the people that were very, very wealthy. Consequently, the Civil War is rapidly going to develop this reputation as a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. And nowhere do you see that more directly than in the city of Detroit. Detroit is not what you probably are thinking of Detroit as, you know, in the 20th century context. It's not the, uh, the, the motor city, not yet anyway. But it is a very important industrial center. And what people, what reactionaries continuously preached was that if you go down and you free the slaves, in other words, if the North wins the Civil War, what you're going to see is a black tidal wave of labor that's going to flood cities like Detroit. It's going to put all of you working white men out of a job. And so when Lincoln issues the Enrollment Act, 
working class Detroiters, people that couldn't buy their way out of the fight, uh, responded in, in a race riot. Um, Detroit's black population wasn't very large at the time, but where and when people were sort of isolated, people of color that is, um, there was some violent episodes. It is a race, uh, race riot in, in every sense of the word. The only place it's probably worse would be New York City. As a matter of fact, that's what you're looking at if you're following along with me still on the PowerPoint. Um, New York was home to not only immigrants of, of many different varieties, but especially the Irish. And because their situation coming into the United States beginning, uh, from the beginning, was relatively serious, um, many of them are recruited into the military. And when Lincoln issues this draft, uh, working class New Yorkers, many of them are of Irish ancestry, begin to push back and rebel against it. You have draft riots in New York, and there are very clear racist, racial overtones to all of them, um, in the sense that a lot of these people are saying, I am not going 500 miles to the south to die for somebody else's civil rights. Keep in mind, the Irish weren't treated all that well when they came to American shores, including and especially New York City. And so, you know, it, it was a little bit of a rub as far as many of them were concerned to ask them to enlist in the service and potentially not come back. Now, you're going to see one of the ways that the government, and Lincoln in particular, is going to curb this issue of dissent, and you're going to see it through a group calling themselves the Copperheads. Now, the Copperheads, for your notes, is a faction of the Democratic Party, and they are a very vocal faction of the Democratic Party. Um, they were very critical of Abraham Lincoln. Sometimes they were just out and out mean to him, um, saying that he was fighting this war simply because he was trying to empower the African-American race. Um, keep in mind, Abraham Lincoln, a little bit of a racist when this war begins, and he made it very clear this is not a war to end slavery. It's a war to preserve union. But even more importantly, these these copperheads are are, are 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 really beginning to almost campaign, right? Remove Lincoln from office, at least defeat him in 1864, uh, because they're campaigning on the idea of peace. A little bit later, and it certainly would encompass all of these copperheads, but the Democratic Party, generally speaking, is going to run on the platform of peace. Uh, they're a little bit vague and open-ended as, as far as exactly what that meant. But these copperheads are a force to be reckoned with. And in a time of war, national emergency, you need all hands on deck. And uh, you, 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 if you were to entertain dissent, disagreement, uh, the questioning of authority, that very well could jeopardize, make the war effort very, very vulnerable, right? So what is Lincoln to do? Well, what Lincoln does is he suspends habeas corpus. He suspends individual citizens' right to a trial during the duration of the war. He's doing this, at least he says he's doing this, as a wartime measure. He's not trying to be a tyrant simply for the sake of being a tyrant. He needs everybody on the same page when it comes to mobilization for the war. But make no mistake about it, the suspension of habeas corpus is going to lead to a permanent expansion of federal power, something that we still live with to this day. You see dissent in the South as well. In 1862, very very similar to the Enrollment Act in the North, you get the Conscription Act in the South. And what the Conscription Act does is it uh, obliges all men from, I, I believe the age was actually younger, 16, all the way up to men in their 60s, to enlist in military service. And once again, if you were drafted, they, they could force you into service. Now, you could buy your way out of service in the South as well, but there was another asterisk that could get you out of service, and that was slavery. If you owned 30 or more slaves, or you were responsible for 30 or more slaves, that got you an exemption. Didn't have to go fight the war. Understand something. This war is about slavery. We talked about this in the Ordinances of Secession. 
Um, it's not a coincidence that the cotton South secedes first because cotton, consequently slavery, far more important in places like Mississippi than it is in a place like Virginia. It's not a coincidence that Virginia did not secede until a little bit later. This isn't lost on the working class populations in places like Mississippi either, though. There was a saying that begins to develop into a form of dissent, go fight for the Negroes of your neighbor. In other words, what you're doing here by fighting the Civil War is fighting to keep an institution, slavery, legal, and we all know that that institution only benefits the very, very wealthy among us. You do see people not only dissent, but out and out rebel. There's a good example, and they uh, transformed it into a movie. It's called The Free State of Jones County. It stars Matthew McConaughey. And in Mississippi, what Jones County is going to do is ultimately secede from the state of Mississippi. They're going to refuse to participate in the war any longer, and a lot of this has to do with the hypocrisy of it. Here we are fighting a war for slavery, no matter how you want to slice it or dice it, it's a war for slavery, and you're letting slave owners, the people that stand to gain the most out of this, you're letting them off the hook. So you see dissent in the South as well. You also see a process that the Confederacy referred to as impressment. Now, for your notes, what impressment was, was Confederate armies pretty much living off of the land of their fellow citizens. Um, keep in mind, they don't have the same abilities to produce for the war that the North does, so they're going to have to live off the generosity of farmers and people that are sympathetic to their cause. And when those farmers and everybody else said, no, I'm sorry, you can't, Confederate armies simply took what they needed. Um, this is going to lead to inflation. You're going to see some economic devastation that's levied on the South uh, during and, and certainly even after the Civil War. And uh, impressment is very much a part of that causation. Okay. Um, so, too, are what come to be known as the Richmond Bread Riots. The fact that you had not only a lack of facilities that could produce food for the war, but also crops that were grown that were food crops, you don't really have them in the, in the South the same way that you do in the North. Um, I told you that uh, you know it was a very good thing that Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina ultimately chose to to secede, and 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 one of the reasons for that was because that's a part of the Confederacy where food crops and other food sources were actually raised. They were not raised in Mississippi or Alabama. The cotton was. What the bread riots were were these angry bands of women that marched to the capital of the Confederacy, Richmond, Virginia, to demand bread, right? Uh, we're starving. Our families are starving. Um, we, we should not be treated this way. And when the powers that be refuse to provide them bread, again, if you're following along with me on the PowerPoint, you're seeing what I'm talking about here. They simply took what they wanted. They took what they needed. Um, Jefferson Davis, the guy that uh, is the president of the Confederate States of America, actually went so far as to threaten to open up fire on the mob of women. It's that level of desperation that's being brought about by, by this war. And so as you can see, guys, um, the, the effect that the Civil War is going to have on the American home front is every bit as important as the military history of the war itself. You might even say that in ways it's more important because it's going to be out of this transition brought in by the war that you'll see the development of the economy uh, that you'll come to associate with the Gilded Age late 19th century America. Um, you'll see what I mean, probably not in this class, but for those of you that go on to take modern American history, certainly you'll make that connection. For right now, that's all I've got.